some basics and uh, regarding classification what do you mean by classification when do we really start the classification can we do the classification in the beginning itself without alignment refinement of classification and how do we deal with orientation and heterogeneity of particles with the uh, challenges in visualizing non native protein in particular the project in which i have worked uh, bound to chaperonin so you have seen the part which i described in more depth in the first uh, seminar lecture the specimen preparation the the classification basically comes in the later stage on the fourth stage where the image processing takes place and i'm going to talk mainly about Uh, single particle uh, em uh, classification so there are topics which will be dealt with uh, by bowmeister and lugan at a later time and uh, at the end i will also be talking another giving talk on combining different structural methods in particular crystallography em and bioinformatics uh, modeling so uh, this classification is signal to noise ratio that's uh, classification is important so the signal to noise ratio is less because the radiation damage limits the total electron dose and because of this we do a low dose data collection and when you do a low dose data collection the signal to noise ratio is weak basically i mean less and in order to enhance that obviously we need to improve the signal to noise ratio so you combine 10 to 15 particles in one class so that you see the class sums actually and that's what you are actually choosing in when you are doing in the eman practicals yesterday thus images of frozen hydrated macromolecules are very noisy and extremely low signal to noise ratio so that's the reason why we do classification why it is extremely noisy so you as you see when you plunge freeze the grid and then take an image in tem and uh, this tm is has lots of particles grow yel particles with end views and side views here you can see es also along with the grow yel so when you look at these particles um, these are the actually particles these are actual real particles single particles which are aligned with respect to the references shown here these are uh, basically you can actually if you have a rough model of reference you can actually down scale the resolution using uh, any software spider or uh, other software and then you can create a model of the particular thing at 14 angstrom which will be which will be a very good reference object to which you align your particle so in that way these particles which you don't see here properly proper, properly are aligned actually you can see that there is a bullet here there is a end view that is this view here and these are all bullet views again you can see there might be uh, only grow yel without the es like this there are here so there there are various i mean th these particles can be aligned efficiently using references and uh, using what uh, uh, steve just now described multivariate statistical analysis you can actually classify these particles into classes and these classes actually are class summed and these class sums are what you see as as class sums basically 10 to 15 particles in each classes here and this gives the signal to noise ratio better and that's the purpose of it and how do you find the orientation of these particles with respect to each other so basically the orientation can be assigned with respect to each other by using what is known as common lines method i think elena might be giving more details on common lines but what basically common lines means is that you have a three uh, two dimensional object and if you are comparing with another two dimensional object and if you are rotating each object and then take the projection of each object in one dimension and you compare that when the angle is correct when they superpose there is a line on which the correlation coefficient is highest basically so it matches and that is uh, basically common line method and that's well used in all the softwares actually is present so you can use this uh, approach uh, this uh, there is another approach which is very sensitive which is less used which is uh, uh, which is uh, central section theorem basically and that is uh, less used and 
there are other ways of assigning oil angles this is by common uh, lines uh, like for example if you have reference images you can do anchor set uh, refinement and then you can assign the euler angles for your class sums basically and that will give you a, uh, a set of images which you can do a 3d reconst 3d reconstruction once you have the euler angles assigned to each classes basically so uh, basically you do a data collection pick particles perform contrast transfer function which you are familiar now in the last two days lectures so then you have to do aligning before you do classification without alignment uh, classification is is uh, ir irrelevant uh, of course it can be done but if you want to find out this uh, the heterogeneity or variation in that it has to be aligned and assign orientation relationship between all projection images and that will give the 3d reconstruction that's what i briefly described you so this is an overall flow chart which i have uh, been using uh, uh, this is the this is the flow in which i usually go first you have take the pdb if you have a pdb reference if you don't have a pdb reference then you will have to generate a first model which can be done through conical tilt uh, uh, which uh, vinod will describe tomorrow so we can generate a um, uh, initial model if you have a pdb then you have the pdb model which can be down scaled to 49 angstrom resolution and then you can align the particles okay after doing the pre processing ctf correction and filtering basically and then after alignment you do a competitive alignment and then uh, alignment or competitive alignment that is when later, later stage will be a competitive alignment but in the initial stage it is just alignment with respect to references and then you carry out the statistical analysis on the aligned particles and then you analyze the eigen vector or eigen images and classify them into class sums to in order to categorize into various homogeneous classes and uh, this is uh, the flow chart assigning euler angles and then uh, comparing with uh, with the earlier model or the first model if the new references generated are very different then you again do the alignment with the new references and then once the new references are no distinct from the earlier references then you know that it is a final stage of reconstruction and you finalize the reconstruction basically so what is the basic formulation or uh, definition of a classification it's a process of dividing a set of images into subset with similar features okay okay you can also think of classification as separating things which are dissimilar to similar groups okay and classification is a computational so this is the explanation that is given in uh, whatsworth web page for spider is a computational procedure that sorts images into according to its similarities okay and you can identif identify eigen images and then separate it based on their dissimilarity and then you have similar classes so you have similar subset of classes which are identical for crystallography people if you think of mm, uh, of uh, different crystal structures different conformation of the same protein in same data set you have it's like you have three crystals and you can solve the three structures in one data collection in cryoem actually it's analogous to that it's not exactly the same though so, but th that's the power of cry uh, cryoem that you can actually class classify the heterogeneous group into homogeneous classes and do a 3d reconstruction <coughs> so e in single particle image each projection images are collected okay and uh, the orientation and position of the particles in all images are very different okay and uh, we have to do alignment before we can do classification so why when do you do classification it's at this stage after you basically align it so before averaging or classification you have to align the particle and this alignment is is characterized by what is known as cross correlation coefficient and when the cross correlation coefficient is highest then the alignment is the best and separate different particles for averaging classification after this process that is alignment which is good so these two are very very closely related so if you have to align and classify after classification generate a 3d reconstruction and then after the 3d reconstruction you re reproject these 3d reconstruction to various references 
and then again do the alignment. So the, your alignment goes on improving each and every cycle. It's just like uh, uh, refinement in crystallography. You basically put something, it improves, and you do the re reconstruction. In this case, it's the reconstruction, and then make that reconstruction as the initial uh, model, and then you improve the f Euler angles assigned to the earlier particles, basically. So refinement of classification, basically uh, you can actually refine the classification. For example, if you have uh, classified a homogeneous set into three classes, you have the three different classes, and this 3D reconstruction of these three classes can be projected into 108 references or 216 references, etc., etc. And then these are the three classes, class references. So these class references can be used as competitive alignment. So you, you have a set of 108 into three uh, classes, basically. For each classes, you will have 108 images as references. And you have the particles, and you align these particles with all the references in the three sets. And you competitively see which one has the best correlation coefficient, and the classes in which it gets the highest hit, it is classified into that. So you will see that when the refinement is unstable, you see that the particles jump from class 1 to 3, 3 to 1, etc., etc. So this is how you do a competitive projection matching and then do the refinement of classification, basically. So after uh, uh, MSA, uh, basically classification is uh, done by using eigen images. So MSA is uh, done typically using algorithms, which uh, Hel Elena is more expertise in. So she will explain in, the, in tomorrow's lecture more on k-means and hier hierarchical ascent classification. You're not in 3D. 3D, okay. She's not explaining that. <laughs> I thought you were explaining. <laughs> okay. So the most common implementation of crystal analysis in EM is the k-means, which is uh, present in all these programs, and uh, hierarchical ascent classification, which is there in Im Imagic. And uh, Imagic's practicals will use this uh, HAC algorithm for classification, basically. So these are some uh, real uh, examples from uh, the papers. Uh, this is a, a structure of CSN CRL4A, which is a ring ubiquitin E3 ligase, uh, regulation by uh, signalosome complex COP9. So that's the complex which is done by cryo-EM method. So there are uh, 2D classifications of something like uh, 1,86,000 particles around and then they do a 3D classification of those particles, and they have found that various different classes are there, with ranging from 30 to 21 percent. And uh, they refine these classes based on some of the features in these two. So they are combining these two classes, and then they are getting one class. And then again, they are further refining it by 3D uh, classification and uh, focus classification. So you can actually classify the uh, particles on a particular region, and then you can separate them, actually. So that is focus classification. And then you get the 6.4 angstrom and 6.7 angstrom structure. Similarly, here, the again, they have used 3D focus classification with signal subtraction. So they subtract the signal some region, mm -hmm. and then do the classification, basically. So and this is uh, a representation of how good the Euler angles are distributed. And um, this also will be done in Imagic e practicals. You will see a plot. Uh, and uh, this is the Fourier FSC, uh, which will be dealt in a little later. Um, people already have mentioned about it. So you divide the data set into two halves, and then you do the 3D reconstruction and compare the correlation coefficient. And then that's how you get the FSC, uh, gold standard FSC. So we will deal with that later on. This is another example of, uh, from Venki Ramakrishnan's lab, uh, which is uh, basically uh, ribosome uh <coughs> particles. And uh, they have done 2D classification and 3D refinement. And they have used reference ribosome for this classification. So you have various uh, factors bound to and, uh, and partial uh, site density of various forms of 
of uh, of um, substrate bound uh, ribosome basically what uh, the cofactor basically in this case so 3d classifications will lead to empty and occupied set so whatever the classification is done there are certain um, uh, noise or let us say substrate or uh, cofactor density present in some other classification when you are at initial stages so the challenge is to move those uh, in information to the homogeneous set okay and that can be done through various means of uh, uh, analyzing the eigen images or there are I, as i heard from steve that the classification can be done uh, almost like 14 different ways uh, of classification so you can use various ways of uh, classification what i will be showing in my example will be the eigen image classification basically So this is an example of uh, exactly the same what I was talking about eigen image classification. So we have a, a set of particles around 60,000 particles of crow eel, uh, and uh, this was done by Dan and uh, Helen in, in Workbeck. So they showed various conformational states of crow eel in the presence of ATP. So so this is the eigen images and uh, initial class averages of aligned Groyal ATP images and uh, eigen images from complexes with single ATP ring. So they have identified complexes with ATP in the cis ring. So let us call it a cis ring. So in the top ring and the bottom ring, we can call it as trans ring. So in if it is single ATP or double ATP, basically eigen images from complexes with double ATP, so both the sides. So there are conformational changes Accordingly, uh, you will see that if it is 1s, there are conformational change in the cis ring. And if it is 2s, there are conformational change in both the cis and trans ring. So, one, so 1d, so double, this is 2s is single side. Two, 1d is double side. Both the sides has ATP. And here also both the sides has ATP in that. So they have identified two different classes for ATP bound and two different classes. ATP bound in both the sides and two different classes for ATP bound in single side, basically. So further uh, refining the classification, they have classified into more uh, subsets, homogeneous groups based on the eigen images. So you can see that you can see a distinct density of eigen image, which shows some variance in the top region of Groyal and the apical region. And that is what is used. So uh, when we do a MSA classification, we say that uh, uh, after MSA, when we do the classification, we say that use this eigen image to separate this into two subclasses, which has one has that variance, one which doesn't have that variance. So you can do basically so competitive alignment and uh, so again, I as I said, we can classify into three classes and allow the particles to align through this to the these three uh, references from the three classes. So that is a competitive alignment. So they have done uh, competitive alignment and got the final 3D reconstruction. And this was clear at all in 2012. So I'll, I'll take over uh, you to an uh, example from a Groyal non-native protein complex, which I did. And uh, probably it's still uh, valid that this is the only structural biology visualization method that can provide three-dimensional structure information from heterogeneous population. Is that right, Steve? Yes, yes. It's still valid, I think. So, um, uh, unlike crystallography, the sample, if it is a little bit heterogeneous, we don't really bother. So, whether it's 90% or 95% pure, it doesn't matter as long as you see the particle and you, it is separate from any other background. Okay? So, so in this work, uh, we were aiming to visualize a non-native protein Rubisco in complex with Groyal, IAS, and in the presence of ADP and ATP. So we had to trap this in the quinary complex. But initial efforts, which you will see, I will describe in a few minutes. Before we go on to that, what is a chaperone? It is basically a molecule which helps other molecules to fold. And uh, there are various uh, functions to stabilize unfolded protein unfold them for translocation across membranes or assist in correct folding and assembly or unfold them for degradation as well, for example, in the proteasomes. 
and I will not go into the history in all. Uh, and per se, chaperonins are basically HSP 60s, heat shock proteins, various uh, uh, heat shock proteins are there, and HSP 60, which is a particular molecule of 60 kilo Dalton, is basically the uh, chaperonins, basically. And class of chaperonins, this chaperonins have two subclasses, which is class one, that are group one, which is uh, prokaryotic in origin, and the group two, which is eukaryotic. So group one has a distinct co chaperon in ES, whereas the uh, group two does not have co chaperon in ES. And there are substrate specificity for group two, but the group one is promiscuous. So they are. Uh, and uh, these are important in protein folding. So Anfinson showed that protein can fold by themselves in in vitro condition for ribo ribonuclease in 1960s, but uh, later on uh, when Art and others found that this does not hold good inside the cell, they realized that the, the component like chaperonin are necessary for protein to be folded in the cell, and this is because the cell is highly cluttered, and this is a cluttered atmosphere, it's like a jam-packed uh, tube in, in Kolkata in a high uh, peak time. So this um, this is the reason why we need chaperones in the in, in, in the cell for rescuing the proteins that are uh, basically prone for aggregation in the crowded atmosphere, and these are uh, also necessary for I mean various Alzheimer's disease, prion disease, Huntington disease are all basically because of the non-native non-native protein interaction uh, and amyloid beta uh, sheets forming non-native I mean. Uh, hydrophobic hydrophobic interactions and all these are implicated in protein folding so that's, that's the reason it's quite important to understand the mechanism how the non-native protein is recognized by GROEL or the chaperonins so this is a general uh, functional cycle which has been described which is being debated as well recently <laughs> so this is uh, from 2001 uh, Neil Ranson where the non-native protein binds to the ATP region and the ATP opens up the cis cage and the co chaperonin comes and binds to the cis cage and the protein folds within the 10 seconds of the half-life period of, of the cis chamber. So if the protein does not fold or if it is folded, in either case, after the half-life period, the negative cooperativity allows the ATP to bind to the trans ring and when the ATP binds to the trans ring, it triggers the cis chamber to release the substrate and the co chaperonin and that's the cycle which is repeated again and again if the protein is folded then it has found its destination if the protein is not folded it is again captured and it on the trans ring and then it's it becomes the cis ring for this cycle right so that's how this images show uh, atp bound form and adp bound form atp bound form adp bound form there was no information of ATP bound form with the substrate and that's what we were aiming to do with, uh, with, uh, with some initial disasters we were able to look at it but uh, what we looked at it we will see in few minutes so the these are the mechanisms of GROEL with the uh, non-native protein how they bind and when did I start? Eleven thirty, isn't it? Eleven huh? fifteen. Okay, so another half an hour I have. Maybe I'll finish early. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Twelve fifteen. Another half an hour. Good. So, uh, so the basic mechanism of uh, Groel is basically. I can show you then. So this basically I is the. Uh, is the dynamics of GROEL, we call it as breathing. So when the ATP binds, the intermediate domain moves by 25 degrees and the apical domain moves by 60 degrees at about the axis in the apical domain and rises by 60 degrees. So it, it rotates by 90 degrees and rises by 60 degrees. So this movement basically turns the, in, in, in the cis cage, which is, which is basically hydrophobic earlier, which would used to look like yellow here, turns it into hydrophilic and this hydrophilic region is conducive for protein folding. So there are debates like whether this 
protein is actively being folded by the grow eel or passively fo being folded. There are two groups which argue for the same thing. Um, so uh, this hydrophilic chamber is now conducive for protein folding and the non-native protein which is pushed into the cha chamber is capable of folding within this chamber. And uh, this is free from the cluttering of the cell. So it basically people call this cage as Anfinsen cage or infinite uh, dilution cage so because it is like infinite dilution in, within the cage and it is free from the cellular cluttering. And this was uh, an important aspect of chaperonin basically. And this is how the ATP bound form basically changes its shapes and forms a co bound dome like bullet shape actually. These were all characterized by EM uh, from the Helen's lab. So now m our aim was not to look at the dynamics, but our aim was to look at a non-native protein bound to the grow yield. And in this case, it was Rubisco for us. And Rubisco had been identified in the 1970s, but it had uh, it had uh, it had uh, eluded the hands of earlier workers because it had some problems inherently because it is a non-native protein and it. Whenever they do complex, they were unable to visualize it. So, um, uh, Wachu and other groups, they mutated some of the residues and they were able to visualize. Okay. In, in this case, what we did was we had a mutant version of, of uh, grow yield, which we used for side, side orientation. But that grow yield was functionally active. And uh, we basically, we wanted to trap that Rubisco using that mutant version. So we were aiming for visualizing a non-native protein, but a little bit of history about non-native protein. The first time a non-native protein was visualized is, is by Helen uh, Group in 1994, where, where they collected this um, groyal non-native protein maladeoidinase complex. So you can see that 418 individual images. So with this, they were able to identify that the substrate was bound. And indeed, we know probably we'll be talking about how you can do a 3D reconstruction with minimal number of particles. We can discuss more because he's actively doing some research on that. So, so the porcine mitochondrial maladeoidinase was visible in the difference density map when they calculated. And this went to, uh, uh, in 1994, it, is, it went to nature, obviously. That was very important at that time. If we do this, we will not get even JMB this time. No. So I had to do something better. What am I doing and what is so important? Because the Rubisco is, is the one of the uh, most important enzyme because it brings the inorganic carbon dioxide into the uh, Calvin cycle into the, as an organic uh, compound. So it is basically fixing carbon uh, molecule, basically. And this process is amazingly slow. Most of the enzymes, when they have a turnover of 1,000 molecules per second or 2,000 molecules per second, this, ha this can have a turnover of many, as much as maximum four molecules of carbon dioxide per second. So the, the mechanism and activity is of, of, uh, of large importance. So we initially tried to do a complex of grow EL with, uh, with uh, ES and the non-native protein. And uh, that was the time when I moved there to Birkbeck and they uh, Helen had uh, did a, Helen and Dan did a ternary complex of grow L E S and uh, with ADP and non-native protein complex. So we did. Uh, so that was my learning time. We did eigen images. We didn't see any eigen images corresponding to density, but you see that there is some change in size. So this is this was done in automated data collection in scripts. So I don't know how. Uh, Automated data collections has to probably it's basically some eucentric focus re because of that or some some uh, non monitoring in in the data collection. This variation in size has happened, but what the main aim is that we were expecting some non-native protein density within the chamber which is folded or within the trans chamber which is open. So we were not able to see. So the the problem was more complicated. Actually, I removed the top image by it's there. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so the the 
then we wanted to simplify the uh, s the binary com the ternary complex to binary complex so we just went on to negative strain with groel and the rubisco molecule and then we tried to image it we when we tried to image it uh, we were not able to see any substrate molecule in the side views because we were in order to do a 3d reconstruction we have to choose the uh, side side views so we chose all the side views and and that exactly we were not able to see the particle why we don't know mm, at that time but now we know why it was so one of the reason was that the non native protein was non specifically undergoing aggregation and when we had a little bit of extra dtt in solution so you see that this is the groel and the non native protein rubisco so it was in solution so it was binding to the groel so then we were happy and then we tried to do a negative stain again with this sample with 5 millimolar dtt again we were unable to see uh, the non native protein bound to the groel so we were puzzled and uh, we went ahead and checked the eigen images of the end views so if you think of a bottle and bottle is pointing towards you that is the end view of groel and the side view is the bottle which is lying down on the floor basically the floor is vertical in this case so when we saw the end views um, we could si see some eigen images which showed some information about the non native protein so we were pretty sure that the non native proteins which were on the particle so this is basically a typical orientation problem which uh, i said i will be discussing about so in this case all the substrate bound groel were going into the end views so this was a orientation problem so we had to deal with that so we w we just proved that the substrate is going to the end views by by means of analyzing the eigen images when we did uh, alignment with the uh, aligned particle and the subsequent reference the eigen images signal improves so when you have eigen images signal at a higher position that is uh, the vector 4 or 5 rather than 8 or 10 the signal is much higher for the substrate there okay so then we were able to see occupied one and non occupied one so we use this eigen image to separate into two classes and then we were able to see the class sum there was some density which was more in the center for the substrate bound one and the, there was less density for the less substrate unbound ones and that was pretty uh, encouraging and then we just wanted to verify biochemically that the substrate is indeed binding so we increase the uh, rubisco concentration from lower to higher concentration and then we were able to see uh, that indeed the groel concentration was increasing as we increased but at after a certain time because the non native protein uh, concentration increases it starts precipitating and we had to do multiple rounds of of um, uh, uh, you know why spin step because you had to remove excess urea in the solution because when we add non native protein it contains urea in it so when we do the viva steps we used to lose protein so that's why you don't see anything here so that then we decided that 1.5 micromolar was the best concentration uh, for uh, complex and then uh, we had a very small amount of d473 mutant which is the elixir which i am talking about here so we wanted that particular uh, uh mutant version of groel because it induces the side views how we will come to that but before that we had to prove by cryo that indeed uh, the substrate was bound in the end view so this is an another example earlier we showed that in the negative stain it is having substrate in the end views so now we are showing that in the cryo also the substrate is bound only in the end views and then we basically took the mutant version of groel so what this mutant version is basically is it is aspartic acid 473 mutated to cysteine and this was conjugated with sulfo smcc hexyse tag linker basically so this hexyse tag was linked to this d473 c mutant so we had this cysteine mutant and then this hexyse tag was linked to it and this basically is the dealing with orientation basically so we now force the substrate bound groel to go to the side views basically so the idea is you have a carbon grid you do a, 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 a the glow discharge we do a, a, the, you have a carbon grid and you do a glow discharge 
in the air. So when you do glow discharge in the air, you get the carbon negatively charged. And the histack binds to it and it doesn't allow the molecule to go and stand up. So that was the uh, uh, way in which it was, we were able to do that. I'm not going into the details of this, but just to tell you that these were the reasons for why people were not able to see earlier the uh, substrate Rubisco bound to the grow yell. For example, one of the reasons was the buffer which in which the complex was made had chloride ion, so we had to change it with without chloride ion. Chloride ion induces some uh, folding in the Rubisco. And uh, later on we found that the aggregation concentration was pretty high, critical aggregation constant what we call was pretty high than what we were using, so we had to reduce that below the critical aggregation constant so that it doesn't undergo aggregation but it binds to the grow yield. And we were, we had to avoid viva spin because the non-native protein was binding and we were losing proteins. So we had to optimize that and then finally the the bull's eye was basically to use this to induce the side view basically, which I just now told you. And then uh, these were crucial for visualizing the substrate basically. So we took a, a cryo, so this is an example of cryo image and negative stain image of the same mutant version with the substrate protein Rubisco. And we went ahead with the cryo image processing. These are the eigen, these are the class sums and the uh, eigen images. So these are characteristic views of the eigen images for tilts on the grow yield particles. And as you go down, you will see that there is a density which basically shows that there is a substrate region in that. So these two eigen images were used to classify the number of particles into two classes basically. One was, uh, in this case we did it as three because the grow yield was, one in, in one case it was down and uh, in another case it was up. So we wanted to classify into three. One is unoccupied, one is top occupied and bottom occupied. So we were able to do that by using the eigen image classification and uh, that's how we got with so in this in this case there is a substrate at the bottom and in this case there is a substrate at the top and in this case there is no substrate so these are the three uh, classes and the three d reconstruction it's so which i was talking analog analogous to crystallography i was talking like it's like three crystal structures or in this case it is two basically because this and this is same in this case it's if you rotate this by 180 degrees, it's the same. So there's like one without the substrate and one with the substrate like. So then we were able to use that as the reference and then we got two classes, occupied and unoccupied. And then the 3D reconstruction shows that the initial 3D reconstruction with 6,000 particles showed that uh, by 2, if you do 3,000, APO without the substrate and this is substrate bound grow here. So with that, we were confident that we are seeing the substrate now, but we wanted to increase the uh, resolutions. We wanted to improve the resolution by increasing the number of particles. So, so when we have limited number of particles, and if you want to increase the resolution, you can actually increase the number of particles, and you can actually go further to a certain extent in resolution better. And what is that limit? Steve may be able to tell me. Uh, at the end of the talk, but uh, so we need to in improve the resolution and also improve the uh, number of particles in each class sums. Uh, we we went ahead to add um, uh, up to 16,000 particles and then we had to do a asymmetric reconstruction because the substrate bound one is asymmetric. It's not. It's no more D7 basically. So C7 basically. So we use the 15,000 particles and then classified into three different classes of 6,000, 5,000 and 4,000 particles. The substrate bound one was two classes. 5,000 had the best interconnecting substrate density and APO one was the other one. So these are the end views of substrate bound region. So grow yell with the substrate bound ES sorry, Groyel with the substrate brown Rubisco basically in the binary complex. This is the movie which shows the 3D reconstruction from the class one classification and class three. So this is, sorry, class two and class three. Class three is APO, 
So this is what you see in APO when you give higher weightage to the spatial frequencies, higher spatial frequency you see helices separately. And this is the substrate bound class 2 basically. And uh, we were able to finally see that actually. <laughs> So one of the interesting thing about this is that when the substrate bounds to the cis ring, the trans ring of this groyl basically, the trans ring of this groyl basically does not allow the substrate to bind. And this was uh, this this was not known why, but it was known that when substrate is binding to cis ring, trans ring doesn't bind Rubisco, whereas the other substrate which uh, Helen's lab had worked, like maladehydrogenase and GP23 they were able to bind to both the ends. So we were able to see some variation in the trans ring, uh, narrowing of trans ring when the substrate was bound to the cis ring and that's what is shown in this slide. Uh, similarly, the class 1 and class 2, we were able to see in the both the substrate bound ones, there was some narrowing in the trans ring. And that is shown here actually with the uh, cross section with class 2 and class 1 with the class 3. Class 3 is the APO one which is in pink. And this is the reconstruction of the all the three classes and then the substrate density that we are able to see out of 50 quarter kilodalton is almost uh, 20 kilodalton we are able to see there. So when we compare this Rubisco crystal structure with the non-native protein, we do not expect any secondary structure or tertiary structure to be associated with it or the quaternary structure, isn't it? So one thing that came to very surprisingly to us was that when we compared this density with the density of class 2, so this is the class 2 density and when we superpose the density just by superposition you see that there is a domain like feature so non-native protein do have some dom domain like features in, in the three from this 3D classification class 2 reconstruction basically and uh, we further went ahead to do grow EL, ES, ATP in the cis ring and the ADP in the trans ring with the substrate grow EL sorry, with the substrate Rubisco. So this is a quinary complex, five components involved in it. And this was done using a mutant version of Groyel because if you do not use the mutant version, the ATP will be hydrolyzed and it will go into a state where the Rubisco is folded and it will release from the chamber. So we wanted to look it into... Symmetry is C1 symmetry. C1 symmetry, asymmetric re reconstruction was done with this. So we were able to visualize the non-native protein which was getting folded. It's like a child get, getting birth in the womb. It's like non-native protein. That's what we I compare it always with. And we were able to see the density in the cis cha chamber. And the similar thing, first time when Dan did with the GP23, he was able to visualize the uh, GP23 folded in the cis chamber. And this was the first time anybody had visualized a protein being folded in the cis chamber. And that went to nature. And uh, you can see that, as I said, uh, there is a, uh, a difference between the substrate binding uh, feature. In this case, it binds to both the ends, GP23. But in our case, when Rubisco is binding to one end, it cannot bind to trans ring because it is narrowing in that region. And that was compared earlier, later on, and we were able to see that in the case of GP23 and malignant the cavity is indeed bigger compared to ru ru Rubisco bound groyel. This is another example. This was the first time uh, we had a 3D reconstruction by Nada Villard in the Helen's lab. That was maladehydrogenase. And they were able to see that uh, at least three consecutive uh, epical domain was necessary for the protein to grow yield to bind the non-native protein. That was the inference. With that, uh, I will... Acknowledgements, basically. Uh, I, uh, Helen, who who had me, who put up with me in, on Welcome Trust uh, Fellowship, and uh, uh, Dan, who basically taught me uh, uh, Spider and and, uh, and a magic image processing, and uh, Art, who was our collaborator, who basically got Lasker Award for identifying chaperones, along with uh, Ulrich Hartl in in uh, Max Planck Institute of Germany, and uh, Elina, who was there always with me when I was there and ISA TVM Directors School of Biology Faculties who has been very helpful. The second part of the quinary complex was done after I moved here. So I went back to work back to do some data collection and then came back and did the 3D reconstruction here. So 
I would like to thank Welcome Trust for funding when I was in Helen's lab uh, as a uh, Welcome Fellow and uh, de Department for my Ramalingi Sami Fellowship, Department of Biotechnology and Isaac Trivandrum for all the support that I've been getting all these years and uh, we are uh, uh, having a big uh, TEM room in the Biological Sciences block for which is being built. Probably when we go on 12th we can go out a little bit and uh, then see the floor before it is being built. <laughs> so there is a SIF which is CIF which is being built with two TEMs, one 300 kV for material science and one 120 kV with all cryo facilities, which is probably if we are lucky would have been installed on the day when we go. The boxes which you saw on the entrance would be moved on 6th, today is 5th, so probably it will be moved on tomorrow I think. Hopefully, <laughs> let us hope. Okay then, and I put something for Elena, so, yeah. so that's Elena there at Bugbeck, along with me, of course, I'm there, yeah. <laughs> Questions, no? Groyel and Robisco has negative co cooperativity. That's what I was showing. Yes. So it doesn't matter whether it's trans or cis because it binds to one end. It cannot bind to other end actually. So when it binds to one end, we call that as cis. Yes. Right. Soumya. If we do glow, uh, if we use a glow discharge, uh, use either in air or in methanol, it makes the grids negative. But if we don't have access to a glow discharge, is there any other hack that we can use to make the grids so negative charge? Plasma cleaner is one way you can just remove the top layer and it basically uh, reduces the hydrophobicity of the surface. But so will it, it make it negatively charged then? What charge? Yes, yes. If it is air, it will be negative, isn't it? And uh, if in it the is plasma cleaning. Yes. Okay. In the plasma cleaner, yes. So if glow I discharge is nothing but plasma. Actually, you apply a high voltage, and it creates a plasma, and that plasma is what charges the surface. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You have plasma cleaner, I know that. Yes, we have that. <laughs> you have, uh, sir, you have done some mutation to uh, stop the ATP hydrolysis. Uh, D in your yes, study, yes, yes. why are you not using ATP non-hydrolyzable ATP analog? That's also possible. So that That's was another possible. alternative which we had. You can always use ATP analog as well. So there are structures which was done in the same lab earlier with ATP analogs and ATP LF3. Basically, LF3 is an analog of ATP. Basically, yeah, we do all all sorts of things. You, Whichever comes to your hand, it doesn't matter. Uh, thanks, Natesh, for a nice talk. Uh, what was the re final resolution for your structure? So there is 11 angstrom for the C1 asymmetric reconstruction for the last one that you saw, the quinary complex, and uh, nine 8 to 9 angstrom for the uh, binary complex. Uh, is it that your Rubusco was already folded and it could not be released? Is that the state you captured, you think? Uh, it is not completely folded yet, but it has a reminiscent uh, intermediate state which has two domains. So uh -huh. I would think that it captures the partially uh, what you call, people call it as molten global uh, state. So that's what we are looking at. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Natesh, uh, you showed a video with uh, Groyal, uh, an animation slide. Can you please go to that? Okay. Tell me the question. Uh, uh, is that uh, obtained from the 3D map? Yes. From PDB or your own result? It's from the 3D reconstruction. Oh, okay. Uh, is it uh, fully docked into it or I can see some of the residues at the back uh, doesn't fit exactly? Yeah, it's from the 3D reconstruction. So it's uh, basically those regions do not yeah, have this densities. One. Yeah, Yes. Yeah, those the regions video. do not have densities, basically, from the three reconstructions that we did. Yeah.
Yeah, I can see some of the residues yes. are there. Yes. It's true. If okay. you reduce the contour, it will cover that set. Okay. <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> Lines on the both sides, right? Yes, yes. Uh, Rubisco does on one Doesn't side. Answer. So uh, I'm asking that uh, when Rubisco binds on one side, can MDH bind to the other side or it, it cannot? Because in cells, you have saponin and you have multiple proteins all the time, right? That's a good question, actually. We have never thought of that, actually. Maybe somebody else has thought of it, I don't know, but uh, as long as the the cavity which is there is is uh, bigger than the substrate molecule, it should bind, that's what I think. But uh, if it is bigger than the, the cavity of the narrow cavity, then it may not bind. So if, because the the chamber is like this. At the in the internal end only you have the hydrophobic patch, right. not at the exposure ends. So if it is closed, it may not access that region. And if it is open, it may be able to access. If it is small, it may be able to reach there, probably. Hey. Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, I have a very short question. Actually, okay. I, I want to show three models. When you have the closing and uh, the modification, I don't know, the, I think it's a Yes, so, yeah. three, so three classes. So cl only classes, th yeah. Two with the uh, So do you, do, do you play with the threshold or you just uh, do the slashing, I mean intersection to show us, just the picture show us, it's an intersection picture or it's a, when it's playing the threshold and... It is basically the cross section of yeah, the just three cross images. Section. Cross section of the image. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, that's it. <laughs> of the 3D conception, yes. Okay, thank you. It's just a cross section. You can do it in camera. Just show the particular section. So to show the region of cross section in that region. Mohit. Hi, Dennis. Uh, thanks for this nice talk. I just thanks. want to know the number. I mean, you told us about the symmetric and asymmetric reconstruction. I'm just curious, like, uh, can you tell me the difference of the number of particles? Like, how much you... Uh, how many number of particles were in the asymmetric reconstruction? If you so around six thousand particles were there in the asymmetric reconstruction. Okay, six and six thousand to five thousand. Five thousand and six thousand. Yes, in the and symmetric reconstruction, when we did, we had total number of particles was six thousand around, and then we extended to higher number of particles, and then we did the asymmetric reconstruction. Okay, and the difference in the resolution was eight and eight, eight to nine in that, and here it is eleven. Eleven. 11. Okay, thank you. Good. If there are any, any more questions, one more? Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, we'll, have go, we'll go and have lunch. <laughs> and we will have the afternoon session. <laughs>